Good evening, my name is Ryan Van De Camp Buchanan, and I'm a true explorer at heart. I've traveled over 40 countries and all seven continents in my life, seeking and striving to discover motivating and inspiring stories to share with the world. And boy, do I have one to share with all of you that truly hasn't been told. My true passions in life are music, sports, and film. And when I was young, my mom used to frantically drive me around the freeways of Southern California in a 1980 Honda Accord, playing Frank Sinatra and Michael Jackson and Lionel Richie and Harry Belafonte. You remember Christopher Cross? Sailing, take me away where I heard I could be. A little over a year and a half ago, I made a major transformation and uprooted myself for the first time in my life from Southern California here in Austin, Texas. I have a good friend of mine who plays fourth chair French horn in the Austin Symphony. She told me one day that Christopher Cross is coming here to the Long Center to play with her and her colleagues. She caught me some tickets, and right before the show, I was out here looking at the Austin skyline on this beautiful veranda where they have an Austin music memorial that celebrates local legends. And this is where I discovered the life of B.L. Joyce. Let's go find Mr. Joyce's memorial plaque. Benjamin Leo Joyce. Joyce, the first band director at the old Anderson High School, demanded high standards. Under his leadership from 1933 to 1955, Anderson won seven state band championships. His emphasis on behaving with character, dignity, and pride made him a respected and beloved member of the African-American community. Joyce was also a World War I veteran, and there was an annual parade in East Austin to recognize his lasting contributions. Thank you so much, Mr. Joyce. After the Christopher Cross concert, I realized I wanted to pursue the B.L. Joyce story and write a movie about him. So I went home and Googled him to discover a wide range of personal accomplishments and everlasting musical impact. Mr. Joyce became a master tailor from the infamous Tuskegee Institute. He played tuba during World War I in our army band. 21 of his students became band directors after him. And others left Austin to become world-renowned professional musicians, such as trumpeteers Martin Banks and Kenny Durham, who played alongside jazz legends such as Duke Ellington, Count Basie, Thelonious Monk, and Dizzy Gillespie. Then there was another Mr. Joyce trumpeteer named Gil Askey, who was one of the architects of Motown Sound. Mr. Askey arranged and composed music for Diana Ross and the Supremes, Michael Jackson and Smokey Robinson. Barry Gordy, the founder of Motown, refers to Gil Askey as the glue that kept everything together. But my next stop was the annual B.L. Joyce Parade where I met the Grand Marshals, Walter Shaw and Melvin Scott. Walter, the co-narrator and author of this movie, played first chair alto saxophone for Mr. Joyce and won three state championships under his direction. Melvin Scott's childhood hero was Mr. Joyce and grew up a block away from him. And his father, Tobe Scott, maintained Austin Musicians Instruments for over 47 years at the J.R. Music Store on Congress Avenue. Both Walter and Melvin have been major contributors to the progress of the script by providing old stories and photos of Mr. Joyce and his bands. They even introduced me to the on-camera narrator and snare drummer, Pastor Billy Joe Walker, and Dr. Bill Agnes Jones, who, who sang in the old Anderson Choir, got our doctorate in music, and sings and plays the piano beautifully. But I would not thoroughly follow through with the completion of this project without the Joyce family blessing. And after thorough and extensive research online, I was able to locate Mr. Joyce's granddaughters in California. Both Debbie and Barbara Joyce have welcomed me with open arms by writing me old stories about Grandpa. But now it's time to forward march out of here and share with all of you the legacy of Benjamin Leo Joyce.
D.L. George was one of the greatest men in my life. As a matter of fact, everything he did, I emulated that. He had first division bands. When I went out to teach, I had first division bands. He would get us up at six o'clock in the morning and wake in the neighborhood up, practicing, marching. I did the same thing. The old bands got first division marching. My band got first division marching. Yeah, on concert season, we had our regular morning session, but we also had our evening session. There was one thing about B.L. Joyce. He was a good disciplinarian. And you hated to hear him say, Shaw, get up and get out, and don't come back. I would get up and get out. But I would come back the next day and he wouldn't let me in. I'd come back the next day. He still wouldn't let me in. I guess about a week, he said, Shaw, get your horn and sit down. That was B.L. Joyce. Very good man. Now, he was a tailor by trade and a very good man. And he was a very good musician. People over the state couldn't understand how this band from Austin could go to the contest and win first division year after year. They said, well, that band director is teaching them by ear. They don't know how to read music. I played with some of the best, Count Basie. Father Earl, Father Hines. And I had to read music. And the only way I could do that is to remember what B.L. Joyce taught us. You had to read music in his band to play the type of music that he put in front of you. He is my idol. I love him and I miss him. Here we are at the home of Mr. B.L. Joyce. It's 1706 East 14th Street in East Austin, Texas. This is the location of where he wrote the infamous and famous letter, The Exceptional Man to the Superintendent of the Austin School District, which began the legacy of the old Anderson Yellow Jacket Band. This one is for you, Mr. Joyce. Do you remember it? Stardust by Hoagie Carmine.
As a student in uh, Mr. George's band, I had the experience of marching in a block band formation. We did a lot of left oblites, right oblites, column rights, column left, counter marches. And uh, it was unique because it was precision. Uh, when we passed in front of a, a judge on a marching field, he could never find anything but a straight line right down the, uh, the middle of the band. And I didn't understand that until I uh, went in the Air Force and became a member of the 746th Air Force Band in Kansas City, Missouri. That's where I saw that where Mr. Joyce got his uh, training from, and it was out of, in the military. And this uh, is one of the reasons he was such a disciplinarian, because marching like that required uh, discipline, self-discipline. East Austin, Texas. We're here at Rosewood Park where Mr. Joyce created the infamous Summer Friday Night Concert Series with his band. And actually on these steps here at Rosewood Park were some of the earliest photos of Mr. Joyce and the old Anderson Yellow Jacket Band were taken. Let's head over to the Church of the New Testament where Billy Joe Walker, our on-camera narrator, will perform on his drums and share his story. I met Mr. B.L. Joyce in uh, 1950. I joined the band and I played uh, snare drum in this high school marching band. Later migrated to a full set of drums. And um, Mr. Joyce was uh, really influenced uh, on me as well as a lot of the other students. He was very much of a disciplinarian and he taught us some good uh, walk up straight, uh, march correctly. Uh, breathing correctly, uh, some of the things about personal life as far as being young men and how to conduct ourselves as far as the opposite sex was concerned. And I could say nothing but positive things about the gentleman. And um, like I said, he not only influenced me, but he influenced hundreds of others uh, that was seeking a way uh, to life and asking direct questions. And he was very ingrained in learning uh, music. Uh, if you didn't know music, he said, you know, it, you, you develop by practicing quite a bit. And so it inclined me instead of fooling around, we had to go home and practice when we got out of school, which was very good. But it's gonna, kept us out of trouble, basically. And so many things good that happened. Of course, we went to quite a few band contests in uh, Prairie View, Texas, which we won most of them for the most part. And the finishing band that I was in was a 1953 band that eventually went to Indianapolis, Indiana, which was quite a, an event for a young person at the age of 16, turning 17, and going out of town on a train and being with other bands. And uh, we were not so much the competitive, but we knew what we were doing because, like I said, there were a lot of bands that really feared us because of the uh, mentality that we had as far as being winners. And that much I attribute to Mr. Joyce. Like I said, he dressed well, he walked well, and as a writer would say, he dressed every day. You know, you never saw him slouching, that sort of thing. So what can we say more? But uh, we miss him, of course. And But the legacy he left us is, is a history maker. So any participation we have during the life of Mr. Joyce, it was our pleasure. And I speak to other members that were members of the band at the time, and we all agree that it was a learning lesson, you know, which we all needed at that generational time. And having known his background, which we learned later, uh, it was very influential to relate to our children as we grew up because today 
it's, you know, I'm pretty sure there are some good high school bands, but that period was, uh, it was exceptional. transition. I had Mr. Joyce two summers in summer band and then Mr. Patterson took over in 1955. Uh, I had excellent, excellent teachers. When, uh, I was the second black band director to finish University of Texas with a bachelor's. Uh, I uh, taught for 40 years and of course, I'm the one who nominated Mr. B.L. Joyce uh, for the Texas uh, Hall of Fame, Band, Band Masters Hall of Fame. I've had some great successes, and I've had some downtimes too. But anyway, you learn to live and learn to do better. Uh, Mr. Joyce li lived one block from my house when I, where I grew up. I'll tell you a couple of stories. Of course, he was my idol when I was growing up. So I went up in front of his house and I was practicing voyaging. And he came right out the door and he said, Little Tove, go home. So I went crying back to the house. My first day at Summer Bend, uh, we were playing some music that was too hard for us. And so I asked the person next to me, I said, Where are we? And he stopped the whole band and he said, Little Tove, go home, never come back. So I cried all the way back to 19th Street. You don't know where 19th Street is, do you? It's MLK now. So anyway, that shows you how old I am. But anyway, we've had some great experiences. And being around Mr. Joyce helped me all through my career. And uh, uh, he was my idol. And Mr. Patterson took me in and, and uh, let me do my student teaching and play in his uh, dance band and that kind of thing. So. He was my mentor, and I had them both. But uh, Mr. Joyce is the one that started the Prairie View League for uh, black bands. I don't know if you know it, but people who look like me, we all went to the same high school in this city. And so uh, and, uh, the, the, the bands, the Prairie View League, started with three bands. It started with Anderson High School, Mr. Joyce was the director, and two other schools, and Anderson won that year. And Mr. Joyce won all but about one contest. It was not everybody made a one, it was one band made a one. That's how good he was. And so he was a great leader, a disciplinarian. Oh, God. Anyway, and when we roll up at contests, the other bands would get mad at us just because we showed up, you know, but we were going to beat them anyway. So, And that never happened after Mr. Joyce left. So anyway, that's my story. I'm going to stick with it. Thank you. It's now time to head out west to California to receive the Joyce family blessing for this film, where we'll meet Mr. Joyce's granddaughters, Debbie Joyce, who will be singing for us in Los Angeles. And then we'll head up north to Seaside, California, where Mr. Joyce spent his retiring years and talked to Barbara Joyce in his old house, who will share some stories how it was like to have Mr. Joyce as a grandfather. Come on, Midas. Come on, Midas, we're almost there. See you out in California, everyone. Black hole, you're so beautiful, but I can't breathe this air. Black hole, I thought I'd escaped, but you're always there. And I'll never I can't 
can't be what you want me to. I'm not strong. I'm weak for you. Starlight, yeah, my star bright. I wish on a star for you. But on November 11th, at 11 11, I crossed my fingers and hoped that you'd let me go. Debbie Joyce. I'm the granddaughter of Professor B.L. Joyce. Um, I'm the daughter of Albert Joyce. They used to call him Skeet, so it was his, that was his um, nickname. Um, I was born in Providence, Rhode Island, and my family came out to Austin, Texas when I was very young, and we visited my grandfather for the very first time, and we went on to Monterey, California, where I grew up. Um, I learned music from my grandfather, and he's taught me so many things, basically about being an exception to the rule. I'll be seeing you in all the old familiar places that this heart of mine embraces all day through. general attitude because he always felt that you know attitude determines your altitude in life which is which is very important uh, my grandfather was trying to teach me how to read music I say trying because I was very adamant about learning to read music but I wasn't as diligent as he wanted me to be um, I was in high school at the time he used to come out every summer we met at my aunt Gladys's house and we went over a lot of things with regards to timing the notes meant I attended classes for about three weeks and then I messed up and he was not very mad but he just said Debbie it's about your priorities what I've learned about him from him was that it's about being that exceptional person about being a competitor and not taking anything for granted Music is my life. Um, that's what my whole family was in general. Uh, my father, Albert Joyce Skeets, was an amazing singer. He uh, taught me a lot about timing and phrasing. He, um, as, long, as well as my aunts, played instruments. They all sang. My sisters and brothers, we all sang, and we all are involved in music. Um, my grandfather basically taught me about diligence, about being exceptional, about being competitor. There were no, no excuses. So at this point in my life, I'm a jazz singer in the Los Angeles area, which is what I do all the time. And I'm enjoying this phase of my life because it's who I am. It's what I was supposed to do. Barbara 
Joyce, and I am the granddaughter of B.L. Joyce. Um, my father is Albert Joyce. His nickname was Skeets, and um, we moved here to California, to Seaside, California, from Providence, Rhode Island. That's where my father met my mother. We came here because, first and foremost, that's where my father's family had moved. His sister, Gladys Joyce McKinney, her, his brother, Richard Joyce, they had moved here to the Monterey Peninsula. And my father was really excited about the opportunity of the possibly joining the Monterey Jazz Festival. So we came here to California when I was two. It was 1957. And uh, that is where I first met my grandfather. So this um, home here that, that uh, my fiance and I live at is uh, on Gladys and Plus's original home. And this is where Grandpa came every summer to be with our family from Austin. When he would arrive, it would be such a special, special time. Uh, Monterey Airport is a very small airport, but he would arrive and the entire family, all of the Joyces would come out to greet him. And when he left, we all saw him off. And when he, we could, I could still see him now with his white handkerchief in the windows because the windows of the airplanes at that time were much smaller. And uh, he would just wave a white handkerchief so that we would know where he was on the plane. It was a very, very special, very special time. But here in this home, um, so many memories, so many good memories of being with my grandfather. Um, during the summer when he would be here, I would come up and spend a lot of days with him. He did a lot of cooking. He always enjoyed cooking. And he would teach us or teach me the importance about eating healthy. Um, these are some of the things that never leave you, you know. Uh, you taught as a child and you might stray from them, but you come back to them. Just eating healthy, eating vegetables. He never smoked, he never drank. Um, and um, eating well, cooking well. But uh, in addition to cooking, he loved to bake. And especially, he liked baking pound cakes. And that was so cool. I love baking pound cakes too, but they don't taste like my grandfather's. They were from scratch and he would, you know, mix it from scratch, you know, by hand. And he would ask me, okay, now you try it. Now you try it. And he was doing it like this, really, really fast. And then he'd say, now you try it. And I would do this and he would laugh. He would really get a big kick out of watching me try to stir that batter and uh, bake it. And I would go down the street and play with my friends for a while, and, uh, but I would remember to return when it was time for that cake to come out of the oven. And he would not let me touch that cake or cut the cake until it was the perfect time. The cake came out, it had to, you know, cool, and uh, then I could have a slice. And when he gave me a slice, to me it was a sliver, but because uh, I wanted, of course, like at least a quarter of the cake. But he would give me a piece of the cake and I would eat it and I'd say, can I have just another piece of cake, Grandpa? And maybe he'd give me just another little slice. Again, never large enough for me. And then he would tell me that that was enough. That was enough for right then. So my love of baking and cooking definitely came from my grandfather. Let's, um, let's elaborate on some loves of Mr. Beale Joyce. Uh, describe his love of God and family. Okay. God was first, foremost. Um, you placed God first in your life, and everything after that came together. Uh, he taught me about the power of praying, uh, the power of praying for not only yourself and your family, but your community, the world. Um, used to always go to church with him. And uh, we went to Hayes Chapel right down the road here in the Seaside. And um, I eventually started singing in that choir. He was so proud. I can still, I can still see me marching in with the choir and um, him being in the front and just sitting so proudly looking at me and nodding his head um, that I was in the choir. He was very proud of that. We're thinking that this project will be one or maybe the only one that will, as they say, tell the story. And I think anyone who is participating with this perhaps feels the same way. Mr. Joyce was outstanding. And there, of course, just like in any other profession, 
there may have been some slight misunderstandings about uh, what this teacher does or what that teacher does. And it's been my understanding that after, I believe, the movement for desegregation began, it was not that Mr. Joyce did not have a degree. It's my understanding that TEA, Texas Education Agency, came in with a new ruling that if you, as you were teaching, you had to have a degree in that specified area. And we all knew that Mr. Joyce had a degree. He probably could have had four or five degrees, but he was a trained musician and he gave so much to the community. And some persons didn't quite get that particular piece of information that uh, he was a trained and a professional musician who had a degree in another discipline. As we can see and hear and remember and recognize, music was his fault. Music was his life. And the fact that this is being done now by Mr. Buchanan, I can only imagine the amount of gratitude, the amount of excitement that this will happen, not meaning that Mr. Joyce has been the one and the only fine, outstanding musician in Austin music, but certainly if we were going to talk about legends and icons, uh, leaders, uh, persons who were just totally, totally committed and showed it in nearly every way imaginable that you could think of, then there's no way the list could be formed without including the name of Mr. B. L. Joyce. Folks, let me tell you, uh, that couldn't be a better project and uh, a man could not be more honored as even though he's deceased. Uh, his legacy will, in fact, and probably impact some other people that watch the movie once it's made and we're looking forward to the completion as well as the intro. Right now we are on the staging process trying to get this together, but I, I feel that, uh, I, well I know I've been blessed through the whole episode, like I said, having uh, been reared as I did along that uh, high school band experience and then stepping out into public life and like I said, it carries on and I just hope that this uh, film project will have an impact on others as well as it did on me. I think that once it's done, uh, it'll be more appreciated. I'm looking forward to it being a historical event for a lot of reasons, not only because the man was educated, uneducated, uneducated if I can use that terminology, but he overcame some obstacles in life and that's sort of hard to do today. Seems like the more negative you are, then the more credence you get, but he started as an upright person and re retained that. And so the influence he had had on many other quite successful young black people, it, it, it helped a lot of us, not only in the music department, but just, but just daily living. And that's what I, I enjoy this project about. And I hope it fares well, because we need this back in our history. We celebrate black history, but this is real black history. <laughs> this would be a very important project it would uh, show young African-American kids what they can accomplish. It would hard work. Uh, it would show them that, uh, uh, that, you know, anything is attainable if you get after it and try to do it. When Ryan contacted me a couple of months ago with regard to the story he was doing on my grandfather, I can't tell you how touched I was. This is a story that I was thinking about for years. This should have been done, and I guess everything is in its perfect time. My family is very touched that you are doing this, Ryan, and if there's anything at all that we can assist you with, anything, we have our blessings. I thank you again. Recently, my sister, one of my sisters contacted me and said, you know, Barbara, there is a, a guy out of Austin that wants to do a, a story, a, a movie about Grandpa, and I thought, Wow, that's pretty cool. Um, I was very excited and when I spoke to Ryan and uh, he told me what he wanted to do, I was just overjoyed. But probably more important was once I realized the, the work that he had already done, 
and um, the research that he had done and the information that he had gathered, some of which I didn't know myself, which is unusual because I'm the historian in the family. Um, and so I learned of certain things through Ryan and, and, and sharing uh, my story, and all of a sudden everything became um, um, so vibrant about the importance of sharing the story. Of course, from a personal standpoint, I've always wanted to share this story, but it was a much smaller audience. It was my children and my grandchildren. They needed to know from where they came. They needed to know the importance of, of, of their great-great-grandfather and their great-great-grandfather and what he did, and uh, that he studied with Booker T. Washington. And, and all these things were just so outstanding. Um, so, so as this has moved on and more of this is being relived about my grandfather's uh, legacy, the more exciting uh, and more excited I have become. Uh, so I am behind this project 100%. And, um, you know, I think the timing of it is excellent. With a lot of the stories coming out now um, about individuals and what they've contributed as individuals, um, I think the timing to share the story of B.L. Joyce, the exceptional man. I met Ryan at one of the uh, B.L. Joyce memorial parades, and he shared with me his, his intentions to uh, make a movie out of the life of B.L. Joyce. And immediately, that had a big impact on me because I couldn't think of anybody else who would be more deserving than B.L. Joyce to, have, to share his life story with America in a movie. So, uh, Ryan and I got together and we uh, started sharing, I started sharing my experiences that I had with uh, Mr. Joyce and uh, it became a regular thing and um, each, each session was uh, very, very interesting and inspiring to me. And uh, I do hope that uh, his story will be shared with everyone uh, who would like to, to meet a man who impacted his community the way Bill Joyce did. Benjamin Leo Joyce, born November 8th, 1886, Plaquemine, Louisiana, to a musically fine-tuned family. Became a master tailor at Tuskegee Institute. His tailoring brought him here to East Austin at Samuel Houston College, where his legacy began. His army buddy, Willie B. Campbell, was the local black high school principal. And after playing tuba in World War I in the army band, Mr. Campbell brought him to Old Anderson High School, where for 22 years, B.L. Joyce, or Mr. Joyce, taught young men and women of African descent the dedication and devotion of being exceptional people in society. He taught them diet, how to dress, how to act, How to be part of an unforgettable type of music and band. Eight state championships. His legacy has lived on and will live on forever. 21 band directors have come after B.L. Joyce. And as far as Motown and Juilliard, his influence and inspiration been such a delightful way to celebrate music and to celebrate man. My journey continues with this legacy. It ended here at the funeral of Mr. Joyce, but Forward March in this film begins here, and I hope with all my heart and my dedicated soul that we bring this story light and we share the legacy of Mr. B.L. Joyce to the world. This was the song 
that was played here at Wesley United Methodist Church, January 31st, 1980, for the funeral of Mr. Benjamin Lee Joyce. Spirit of God is spent upon my heart. Let's go. Let's forward march and let's make this happen. We're creating a story that all can celebrate, understand, and be inspired by.